Number three, Rita Curran. In the summer of 1971, 24-year-old Rita Curran moved out of her parents' home and into an apartment she shared with two roommates in Burlington, Vermont. Rita didn't know her roommates very well. Their apartment was on one of the quietest and calmest streets in Burlington. Rita was a second grade teacher. During the summer, she worked as a maid at a local motel. She was also taking graduate classes at the University of Vermont. On the night of July 19, 1971, Rita went to practice with her barbershop quartet. She returned home shortly after 10 p.m. Her one roommate was home, but she left around 11.20 to go to a restaurant. At the restaurant, she met up with the other roommate and a male friend. All three returned to the apartment at about 12.30 p.m. They talked in the living room for about an hour. Then one of the roommates went into the bedroom she shared with Rita. She found Rita's new dead body on the floor. The police were immediately called. 24-year-old Rita Curran had been raped, beaten, and strangled to death. The three roommates all shared one key to the apartment. When the roommate left for the restaurant, she unlocked the door behind her. The city of Burlington was considered safe, so it wasn't uncommon for people to leave their doors unlocked especially on Rita Street, which was considered one of the safest in the city. The police believe that the killer got inside through the unlocked front door. Nothing in the home had been disturbed, and nothing had been stolen. The murder shocked the people of Burlington. Many citizens thought it changed the city because they lost their sense of security. The sale of locks went up in the days after the murder. What added to the citizens' paranoia was that no one was arrested in the wake of the murder. It wasn't long before the case went cold. Decades passed and no progress was made on the case. In 2014, some evidence, including a cigarette butt that was found next to Rita's body, was sent for DNA testing. A male DNA profile was created. The police had 13 main suspects and they got DNA samples from all of them. None of them was a match. The killer's DNA was also entered into several databases, but no match was found. So the case was shelved. In 2019, 48 years after the murder, the case was reopened and a team of detectives was assigned to the case. But not much progress was made on the case. So it sat cold for several more years. In August 2022, the clothing Rita had been wearing that night was sent for DNA testing. Also, the DNA profile taken from the cigarette was sent to Parabon Nano Labs, the DNA laboratory, so that genetic genealogy could be done on the DNA. The genetic genealogy led them to a man named William DeRuse. DNA was found on the clothes, and it also belonged to William. William and his wife, Michelle, lived in the apartment above Rita. At the time of the murder, they had been married for about two weeks. The police interviewed them after the murder, and they said they didn't see or hear anything. Michelle was interviewed several times afterward, and she claimed that both she and William were home all night. Then in 2023, the police learned that Michelle was living in Eugene, Oregon, and had a different last name. Shortly after the murder, William moved to Thailand and became a Buddhist monk. They got divorced shortly afterward. When Michelle talked to the cold case investigators, she said on the night of the murder, she and William got into a fight. He left the apartment to cool down. After the police visited them for the first time, William told her that if the police ever talked to her again, to tell them he never left the apartment. The police didn't think that Michelle knew that William killed Rita. William had a criminal record and Michelle thought she was protecting him from being wrongly accused. William DeRuse moved back to the United States in 1974. He settled in San Francisco, California and became a counterculture guru. He got married for a second time. Cold case investigators talked to his second wife. She said that William had an explosive temper. One time he stabbed a friend in front of her. 
the friend, wasn't killed. William told his wife at the time he thought he was stabbing her. Also, one time, he choked his second wife. Eventually, William and his second wife became estranged. So all the police had evidence that William DeRuse killed Rita Curran and he didn't have an alibi for the time of the murder, he couldn't be charged with murder. He died in 1986 at the age of 46 in a hotel in San Francisco. He had overdosed on morphine. In February 2023, the police announced that after 52 years, the murder of 24-year-old Rita Curran was finally solved. Number 2. Rachel Zendayas and Lisa Goddeck Camarillo, California is a city that is about 50 miles northwest of Los Angeles. In the early 1980s, it had a population of about 37,000. It was home to 20-year-old Rachel Zendejas. Rachel was the single mother of two. She lived with her brother in an apartment in Camarillo. She was also a college student. On the night of January 17, 1981, Rachel hired a babysitter to watch her kids and the babysitter brought a friend. Rachel went out and met some friends. They went to a nightclub in Oxnard, the city that neighbors Camarillo. She returned home at about 3.15 a.m. and collected the babysitter and her friend. She then drove them home. Rachel returned to her own home and parked her car in front of the apartment. But Rachel never made it inside the apartment. Hours later, around 6.30 a.m., her new dead body was found in a carport across the road from her apartment. Based on the evidence, the police pieced together what happened. When Rachel returned home, she was attacked. She was stripped naked and raped on the lawn of a vacant apartment. She was then dragged naked and on her knees across the road to the carport. Her attacker killed her by putting his hand over her mouth and pressing his forearm against her throat. The police eliminated the usual suspects, like Rachel's estranged husband and her boyfriend. They believed that the killer lived in the area and happened to see Rachel when she returned home. A witness saw a man in the area and this sketch was released. He was described as 5'8 with dark hair he was possibly in his 40s. Unfortunately, it wasn't long before the case went cold. At some point, the killer's DNA was inputted into law enforcement databases. In 2004, the police learned that a match to the DNA had been found. But, it wasn't a match to a suspect. Instead, it was matched to another unsolved case that happened in Oxnard. In May 1981, 21-year-old Lisa Gondek was visiting California from Connecticut. She decided to stay. She got an apartment in Oxnard and got a job at a clothing store at a nearby mall. On the night of December 11, 1981, Lisa went out to two nightclubs in Oxnard. Afterward, she dropped her friends off. She returned home around 1.30 a.m. Around 3 a.m., the fire department received a call that Lisa's building was on fire. The fire department arrived and put the fire out. The fire was started in Lisa's apartment and they gutted the apartment. In the bathtub, they found the dead body of 21-year-old Lisa Gondek. The medical examiner determined she had been raped and manually strangled. Sadly, at least two neighbors heard Lisa screaming but didn't call for help because they didn't want to get involved. After the murder, the killer set fire to the apartment to possibly destroy any evidence he may have left behind. However, he didn't know he had left behind an incredibly important piece of evidence behind his DNA. So in 2004, the police knew that they were looking for one killer. But they didn't know who he was. In hindsight, the police saw major similarities between the two murders. Both victims were white women with brown hair who were 20 and 21. One was killed in January 1981 and the other in December of that year. 
They were attacked in the early morning hours after returning home from a night out with friends. In fact, they both attended the same nightclub in Oxnard. Nearly two decades went by. Then, genetic genealogy was performed on the DNA. It led them to a suspect, Tony Garcia, who lived in Oxnard. Not much information about Garcia was released. What is known is that he grew up in New Mexico and he came to the Oxnard area in 1974 while serving in the Navy. He was discharged in 1980 and chose to stay in the area. He worked as a karate instructor and as a carpenter. It was not made public if he had a criminal record. On February 9, 2023, 42 years after the murders, 68-year-old Tony Garcia was arrested. The police said he had been hiding in plain sight for the past four decades. Tony Garcia is currently being held in the county jail until his trial. He is innocent until proven guilty in a court of law. Number 1. Pamela Conyers In the autumn of 1970, Pamela Conyers was 16 years old and in the 11th grade. She was born in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Her family moved to Baltimore, Maryland in the early 1960s. Pamela's father worked for the Westinghouse Corporation. Pamela played the flute in the school band. She had many friends and her neighbors and teachers thought she was a respectable young woman. Her parents thought she was very responsible and always told them where she was. On October 16, 1970, Pamela went to a pep rally at her school. She then planned to go to the Herondale Mall to buy shoe dye for a pair of shoes she planned to wear to a school dance the next night. When she didn't return home from the mall, her parents reported her missing. The police went to the mall, but her car was in the parking lot. The police questioned the employees at the store and at least one person remembered her coming in. Three nights later, her car was found on a dirt road about four miles from the mall. The car was unlocked and the keys were missing. Inside the car was a ball of shoe dye. The police searched the area until it became too dark, but they didn't find anything of interest. They began searching the next morning. They found the dead body of 16-year-old Pamela Conyers. She was fully clothed. The medical examiner determined she had been sexually assaulted and strangled to death. Many people thought that Pamela's murder was connected to three other murders that were committed in the same area around the same time. Nearly a year earlier, on November 8, 1969, Kathy Sesnick went to the Edmondson Village Shopping Center in Baltimore. Catherine was a Catholic nun who taught at Archbishop Keogh High School, a private school for girls in Baltimore. She was going to the mall to buy a gift for her sister. After that, she went missing. Later that night, her car was found illegally parked across the road from her apartment complex. It's believed she made it to the mall because a box of buns from a bakery at the mall was found in the front seat of her car. But there were no signs as to what happened to her in the car. The police believe she was kidnapped, but she returned home from the mall. Four days later, on November 11, 1969, 20-year-old Joyce Malecki went shopping at the same mall where Pamela last went shopping. Joyce also went missing. Two days later, Joyce's body was found partially submerged in a river less than 10 miles from the mall. She was fully dressed. Her wrists were bound behind her back. She had been stabbed in the neck, but that wasn't the cause of death. She had either been strangled or she was drowned. There were also about 15 superficial cuts on her face and neck. About two months later, on January 3, 1970, the badly decomposed body of sister Catherine Sesnick was found. She had been killed by a blow to the head with a blunt object. The police thought it was something like a ball-peen hammer or a tire iron. Six-year-old Grace Montanay, who went by the name Gay, was a 16-year-old cheerleader who lived in Reisterstown, Maryland. Reisterstown is about 25 miles from downtown Baltimore. About a year after Pamela went missing, 
Kay was dropped off at her school by her mother. She told her mother she was going to a beauty pageant rehearsal and that she would get a ride home later. But she didn't return home. When her father drove to the school to look for her, no one was there. The police found two young girls who were at the school when Gay was dropped off. They said that after her mother left, she got into a dark blue or green car. Then the car left the school. The police also learned that a man had approached Gay at the mall across the road from her school. He asked her if she was interested in a modeling job. Two other students said a man approached them with a similar offer. They said he was driving a dark green late model Mustang, but the man was never identified. Two days after Gay went missing, her body was found in a graveyard behind a Catholic church. She had been burned on her back and shoulders. She had been beaten to death. It did not appear that she had been sexually assaulted. Many people saw several connections between the four murders. They were all white women between the ages of 16 and 26 who were murdered between 1969 and September 1971. All four went missing and their bodies were dumped in remote areas. Two had been strangled and two had been beaten to death. Also, all four had connections to a shopping mall. Three went missing after they went to a mall, two from the same mall. While mysterious man at a mall approached Gay. Another thing they had in common is that no arrests were made in the cases and they quickly went cold. In 1994, there was a strange development in the cases. Two former Archbishop Keogh high school students, where sister Catherine Sesnick taught, accused the school's chaplain, Catholic priest Joseph Maskell, of sexual abuse. Several other women came forward and said that they were also abused. One of the first two women to come forward had a bizarre story. She said that days after Sister Catherine Sesnick went missing, Maskell took her to the woods where her body was found. He brought her to the body and said, You see what happens when you say bad things about people? The woman said she remembered brushing maggots off Catherine's face. But there were serious doubts about her story. Notably, maggots were not alive at that time of the year in Maryland. Joseph Maskell died in May 2001 at the age of 62 from a stroke. The Archdiocese of Baltimore ended up paying settlements to his victims. In 2016, the police reopened the investigation into Catherine Sesnick's murder. This involved talking to former students who were abused. The evidence was examined from Sesnick's murder and male DNA was found. In February 2017, Maskell's body was exhumed and a DNA sample was taken. Then in May 2017, Netflix released the seven-part documentary called The Keepers. It profiled the murder of Catherine Sesnick and Maskell's sexual abuse case. It also talked about the murder of Joyce Malecki. Shortly after the documentary was released, it was revealed that Maskell's DNA did not match the DNA from Catherine's murder. It's unknown whether the DNA was compared to the other unsolved murders. Five years passed and the evidence from Pamela Conyers' murder was examined. In 2023, genetic genealogy was performed and led them to a suspect. His name was Forrest Clyde Williams III. He was 21 years old at the time of the murder. It is not believed that Williams knew Pamela before the murder. Not much is known about Williams. When he was a teenager, he moved from Virginia to Pasadena, Maryland which is a city not far from where Pamela's body was found. Then, sometime after the murder, he moved back to Virginia. Williams was arrested a few times in the early 1970s for minor crimes like drunk and disorderly conduct. In 1990, he was arrested for fishing without a license. Sometime in the 2010s, he was charged with assault, but little is known about that charge. He worked as a carpenter. He had two children, a son and a daughter. He was a big fan of NASCAR and the Dallas Cowboys. 
Forrest Williams died in Salem, Virginia in March 2018 at the age of 69. In March 2023, the police announced that after 52 and a half years, the murder of Pamela Conyers had partially been solved. They said they weren't completely closing the case because they think that Williams may not have worked alone in the murder. They are hoping that someone with knowledge about the murder will come forward. The police also believe that Williams may have committed other murders. At the time of this recording, the murders of Catherine Sesnick, Joyce Malecki, and Grace Gay Montanay are unsolved. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.